Hey, Peter, long time reader here. First time caller. Yeah, a long time first time. What do you think of the assertion by many doctors and researchers that if you eat a balanced diet, i.e. low in processed foods, high in fruits and vegetables, that supplementation is completely unnecessary and in fact you're probably just peeing away most of the nutrients? Thoughts? Um, you know, it's tough because supplementation is such a broad concept that I don't know what we're really referring to there. Um, so for example, would taking vitamin A or vitamin C or vitamin E, uh, be required under the circumstances you describe? Almost assuredly not. Um, and A was A, E, D, and K, you're not necessarily peeing those out because they're Yeah, fat those soluble. are fat soluble. That's so yeah, but, um, but, but it's hard to say that, you know, you don't require any supplementation. I think that's a bit of an open question. In fact, we did a podcast a while ago with Chris Masterjohn where we went, in, we went super deep on the B vitamins. Um, and in fact, the role of B vitamins in people that have mutations in an enzyme that is responsible in part for the methylation of these things. So I guess I'd have to take some issue with that. I understand that that's a very, like that's the cool kid approach today. I think I think people love to be cool today and sort of say, well, I, I love supplementation cool. is yeah. a scam and you don't need any supplements. Um, and I understand why people say that because the opposite end of that argument is equally nonsensical in my mind, which is like you need to take 2,000 supplements a day and you know you need to supplement like biotin levels and stuff like that. I, I think that's also sort of equally silly. So, so I guess, no, I, I would sort of disagree with that. But you know, I'd also put this in the context of we might be splitting hairs, right? In other words, if you're really eating an awesome diet and you're exercising really well and you're sleeping really well and you're getting lots of outdoor exposure to sunlight, making your own vitamin D, et cetera, et cetera, what's the difference between you being on theoretically the most optimized supplement regimen versus not? It might be so small that it's sort of like, we're, 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 you know, picking the wrong thing to discuss. Mm. I think one thing too, to maybe differentiate is if you have a deficiency yeah. versus super physiological doses, yeah, is yeah. The, probably the, one of the things so that I, I've never calculated this. Maybe somebody has where they, you read these articles about superfoods, all the foods that you must include in your diet every day. And if you, I, like, I just if you add all those because, up, yeah. You'd be the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Nice <laughs> Ghostbusters reference right there. <laughs> Score some points there. Um, that being said, I do think that superfoods are super if they're providing something that you are deficient in. Because then you'll feel like, wow, this is life-changing because I had some deficiency and now I've made it up. Right. If, if you have zero vitamin C, uh, you're, you're in a bad place. If you have zero vitamin D, you're in a bad place. Having vitamin C above the level upon which you can uh, make enough proline to make enough collagen to not get scurvy, not that helpful. Yeah. That said, you know, look, there are some other interesting applications here. I do think there's, I'd love to see some research done on mega dose intravenous vitamin C for viral infections. There was some research that was done on this, um, I, I think in the 60s, and I, it, my recollection is it looked sort of interesting, but wasn't really followed through upon. Um, Obviously, Linus Pauling, who himself yeah. is a two-time Nobel laureate, although I think one of them was a Nobel Peace Prize, and not to diminish the Nobel Peace Prize, but I, it sort of fits in a different He category. was close on uh, elucidating the structure of DNA, too, right? With uh, Crick and Watson, he was either on their heels or right there. Y yeah, So, so, but, but Pauling was a huge proponent of vitamin C, and he was given enormous reign to, to sort of, you know, propose this and put this forward. Um, in large part because of his credentials, though I think in, for the most part people today view many of his views with respect to hyper doses of vitamin C as sort of nonsensical. Hmm. There's, a, there's a book of letters by Richard Feynman. Yeah, back in the day, people used to write letters you know, rather than, I guess, email hmm. and tweets and things like that. And there's a letter from Linus Pauling to Richard Feynman. There's maybe, and then I think a Richard Feynman response, but Feynman was diagnosed with uh, esophageal, cancer. esophageal cancer and Pauling was putting in his two cents and his 
words mm-hmm. of encouragement and things like that. But he talked about vitamin C and I think a couple other things. And it was almost like organic foods and things like that, which was pretty interesting. But one yeah. of the things too with vitamin C that typically you will pee it out. And I think that that's why when you talk about like taking IV doses, that's one way to actually push up levels of vitamin C where you otherwise couldn't do it, right? Yeah, you can't do it orally, orally. not so much because of the excretion. You'll excrete it both in the, um, whether it's intravenous or oral. It's just that the gastric acid does not permit the absorption of vitamin C beyond Mm -hmm. a certain level in in the gut. This is a pet theory too. It's around epidemiology with uh, vitamins, when you see vitamin studies or people who are into multivitamins or, uh, you know, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin K, whatever right. the case is, is that early on they'll, they'll look at the, they'll look at the epidemiology and they'll see an association with something like, let's say vitamin E intake and health or longevity right. or whatever the case may be. And part of that is because there's some early research that's not very well known or widespread about the benefits of vitamin E. And there's something called the healthy user bias in epidemiology. So the people who are on like the cutting edge are, are super health conscious and they're, they're scouring, reading the papers or whatever. And in this case, it's like you can go deep dives on blogs and you're just trying to keep up with it. So these people might add vitamin E into their diet along with, I don't know, almost like an infinite number of other things that they're also doing to improve their health and they'll find this association so they say so it becomes more widespread and then they'll actually do a more rigorous study and then they might actually randomize uh, people into one or the other group to try to get rid of the confounding and all the biases inherent then the study will come out in the new england journal of medicine and i think recently there's been some studies that come out and They'll say that wasn't a significant effect or the effect that we, you know, that there's a large association in the epidemiological studies. And then when the randomized control trials come out, we don't see such an effect, but we've basically eliminated that healthy user bias by actually doing the experiments. Yeah. And, and, and these are, these are tough questions because I know it's tempting to just sort of say, well, the epidemiology is always wrong on everything, but I don't know that's necessarily the case. I mean, sometimes you could argue time of exposure matters and sometimes epidemiology is better at capturing time of exposure than RCTs. So I don't know. I, I, I get, I get frustrated, not in a bad way, not like in a, in a, but in a way that says, I wish we could do better. I wish we could understand these things better.